This course on crystallography has nine lectures, taking you all the way from elementary concepts to dealing with symmetry and its application in the solution of structures. Uh, we will also cover polycrystals, that means aggregates of crystals, which are not necessarily arranged randomly in space, uh, and phase transformations that are dominated by crystallography. So these are transformations which do not involve diffusion. To help you, I've created an awful lot of electronic resources that you can download freely from this website here. Um, there are movies and slides and various other items, too many to mention. Uh, so please do explore that website. There also is a book, the first nine chapters of which are highly relevant to this course and includes worked examples. This book can be downloaded freely from the website uh, indicated here. And there is a second book which has just been published, the third edition of Kelly and Knowles, which contains uh, more detail, but is available as a hard copy in the department library. So I'll begin with some elementary concepts and many of you will have come across this before, but I'd like to repeat them again so that we all have the same starting baseline. So the definition of a crystal is that there is long range periodicity. Now by long range periodicity, I mean that we can represent the crystal in terms of a small number of atoms and simply repeating that pattern of atoms produces the entire description of the crystal. So we can actually describe the positions of all the atoms by simply looking at a handful of atoms that are arranged in a particular pattern. So if I start off at this black point, come to this red atom and a black atom, then I know that the next one is definitely going to be red and the one after that is going to be black in an ideal crystal. The second aspect about crystals is that obviously, because they are arranged in a particular pattern, uh, there will be strong anisotropy of properties. So the properties along the diagonal direction here will be different from the properties along this direction and so on. So crystals are characterized by anisotropic properties, even if they are cubic. In contrast, an amorphous material will have a random array of atoms. And to specify a structure, I would need to specify the position of every single atom in that body. There is no long range periodicity, so there is no repeat pattern that we can rely on. And the properties of an amorphous material for that reason, on average, will be isotropic over large distances. Now, an example of a glass is a solidified magma. And when that is induced to crystallize, you get crystallite crystals growing from that magma. So this is the crystalline phase and this is the glassy phase. Another example which you may be more familiar with is a glass, ordinary glass, silica glass the sort of stuff we use in windows. Uh, it's isotropic, uh, unless it is heat treated in a particular way. And these are steel drills uh, that are microcrystalline. They contain billions of tiny crystals, which give the properties necessary for its cutting and drilling action. So to summarize, you know, Crystals are characterized by long range order and the particular crystals that I've illustrated here, the crystallite and the steel, uh, they, have, um, they have a solid structure. Uh, and the difference between a solid and a liquid, I'll point that out in the next slide. Here we have a, a solid crystal in which the molecules are anisotropic, but nevertheless, these molecules are ordered 
and therefore this satisfies the definition of a crystal. With a bit of thermal activation, uh, these molecules which are not strongly linked to each other, uh, they can be induced to become a little more random and change into a liquid and still maintain a certain amount of order, okay? So these are called liquid crystals and used to be very popular in electronic devices before the onset of the organic polymer displays. So the difference between a liquid and a solid is that a liquid cannot support a shear stress. So liquid crystals actually flow so if you touch one of those old liquid crystal screens uh, and push gently, then you will see that the contrast changes because the liquid has flowed during the application of that stress. So it's a true liquid, it can flow, and yet it has crystalline characteristics because you introduce this anisotropy by partial alignment along the vertical axis in this case. So crystals need not be solids. Now this is a, a beautiful example of quartz crystals. It's a picture that I took in a particular location in China. And you know, this is what uh, most people would recognize a crystal as, a, a very elegant looking shape. And that shape happens because there are particular planes on which the crystals have a low energy. So these shapes uh, have evolved over long periods of time. So they are close to equilibrium shapes. Uh, and therefore, you know, if you, had a, uh, if you had a completely isotropic material, the equilibrium shape would be a sphere because that would minimize the amount of surface per unit volume. But in this case, particular planes of atoms have a low energy. So the crystal tends to develop facets on those particular planes uh, to give you the lowest amount of interfacial energy on average per unit area. However, you've already seen an example of a crystalline material which, in which the shape is not actually determined by minimization of interfacial energy or surface energy. It's basically the requirement that we have some engineering function. So this drill, for example, has a specific shape for cutting while pushing. And this is a single crystal turbine blade made of a nickel-based alloy. Uh, it's single crystal beyond about, uh, about here. Um, and the reason why this turbine blade from a jet engine with its aerodynamic shape is a single crystal is because grain boundaries are easy diffusion paths. And therefore, to avoid those and therefore to maximize creep resistance, you grow single crystal turbine blades. However, the blade has an engineering shape, which is equally beautiful. It has a lovely aerodynamic shape, which gives the thrust to the engine when the blade is rotating. So we have to get away from the idea that crystals are simply beautiful looking objects. They have another beauty in terms of their engineering function. So the silicon that goes into electronics, for example, is grown as a very, very large cylindrical, uh, not cylindrical, but a solid cylinder of single crystal. And then it's sliced for all the electronic uh, device fabrication. Now to illustrate to you the anisotropy of crystals, the turbine blade actually is a good example because uh, it, is, it is grown in such a way that the elastic modulus uh, along the length direction is different obviously from the elastic modulus uh, normal to that and helps to minimize the vibrations of the blades. Here is a, a 3D plot showing how the elastic modulus of silver, which is a, a cubic uh, symmetry, varies with the crystallographic orientation. So the modulus is largest along the body diagonals here and smallest uh, parallel to the edges of the crystal. Uh, the 
molybdenum crystal is a, is a body-centered cubic crystal, has a different kind of anisotropy compared with the silver crystal, with the maximum modulus being along the edge of the cube. So this is really quite important when considering uh, the use of single crystals or when looking at the behavior of polycrystals in which the individual crystals are not arranged at random. Now, this is what a polycrystalline material looks like in two dimensions. So this is a sample of a particular material which has been uh, polished and etched. These are all the boundaries between the individual crystals. And some of these boundaries are incredibly straight and faceted because they happen to have very low energy compared with boundaries between these two crystals, which have a large misorientation. So this is what a polycrystalline material would look like. And in general, most polycrystalline materials do not have any holes in them. In other words, the crystals grow together until they touch and they fill all of the space, okay? So that's what a polycrystal looks like. Uh, now, just looking at this image, uh, we can work out the size of the individual, uh, size of, average size of the crystals. Uh, we can work out the shape of the crystals and we can put that in theories for strengthening, etc. But the problem is that uh, in this optical microscope image, we do not actually know the orientations of each of these crystals relative to a sample X, uh, frame of reference. But there is a technique called uh, EBST or energy uh, electron backscattered diffraction in which we not only see the shapes of the crystals, but the colors here represent the crystallographic orientation of each of the crystal relative to a sample frame. So we can now routinely look at specimens, obtain the complete information about the crystallography relative to the sample axes, uh, about the nature of the boundaries between the crystals, the shapes of the crystals, et cetera. So this is done on a scanning electron microscope. Okay, let's uh, go back to the idea that to represent a crystal which has long range periodicity, uh, you only need to define a handful of positions of atoms. And then you simply repeat those in however many dimensions you like to generate the entire location set of every atom in that material. Now, I'm going to start by talking about an imaginary pattern, all right? So this, this is an imaginary two-dimensional pattern uh, uh, where these points here are arranged in a square lattice. A square means uh, this side has the same magnitude as this side and the angle here is 90 degrees. And because the atoms at the corner would be shared with four other squares, only a quarter of this belongs to this particular cell and therefore there's only one of these points per cell. So we call this a primitive square lattice because there's only one point per cell. And if I repeat this pattern in two dimensions, I will gen generate an array of square points. So these points are known as the lattice points because each one of them is exactly equivalent to the other and the environment, if I stack these cells together, would also be identical for every one of those lattice points. Uh, these are two further kinds of two-dimensional lattices. This is a rectangular lattice and there's also a point in the middle here. So we call this a centered lattice. Uh, this is a primitive rectangular lattice where these edges are no longer equal and the angle is still 90 degrees and there's only one lattice point per cell. This is a hexagonal lattice uh, where the edges here are of equal magnitude and the angle is 120 degrees and it's a primitive lattice and more general, the oblique lattice where these angles, uh, these edges and angles are no longer 
nice numbers. So this is not necessarily 120 degrees. This is not equal to this. It turns out there are only five possible ways of arranging a regular set of points, a periodic set of points in two dimensions. Every other possibility that you try will fall into one of these five patterns. And that means that if you are looking at wallpaper, printed wallpaper, in principle, there are only five different patterns that you can find if you look carefully. So here, for example, is a, a wallpaper. This is particular one is from Darwin College in Cambridge. And I can identify a repeat pattern. So here, this particular rectangular cell, if I repeat that, it will generate completely the entire pattern, okay? Now, notice that uh, when I repeat, uh, uh, the cell, the shape of the cell should be such that it allows me to fill the whole of this, whole of this two-dimensional space. In other words, uh, uh, another definition for a unit cell, which you repeat in order to reproduce the pattern, is that it must be space filling. Uh, this is space filling because I can stack more of these together without leaving any holes, but this is not. If I put another triangle here, then I'm left with a hole here, okay? And similarly, this is not a unit cell. Uh, you have to be able to stack them in order to fill the whole space. So there are only five different ways in which you can print uh, a pattern on a wallpaper. This uh, is um, the lattice and we need to make it a little bit more formal that the edges are identified by what we call the basis vectors A1 and A2. Uh, we know the angle between these vectors and we know their magnitudes. And these vectors uh, define completely the unit cell which when we stack we reproduce the whole of the pattern. Uh, so for example here I'm stacking them. And a good example of a two-dimensional crystal comes from carbon, perhaps the most famous two-dimensional crystal, where we have this sheet of uh, graphene and the graphene can take various forms. So if it's folded up and zipped together, you get your carbon nanotube and so forth. And this is how the atoms are arranged uh, in a single layer of uh, graphene. And the unit cell describing graphene is this, okay? So here we have a hexagonal unit cell. This angle is 120 degrees. The magnitude of this vector is the same as that. And these are the lattice points. In order to generate the structure of graphene, you've got to put a pair of carbon atoms, this, the black and the red, at every single one of those lattice points, okay? So we've now actually put atoms onto the lattice in order to create the crystal structure of graphene. So a lattice is just an imaginary object. It's when you put atoms onto each of those lattice points in a manner which doesn't change, which ensures that the environment around each lattice point remains identical then you generate the crystal structure. In three dimensions, we have to specify three basis vectors, A1, A2, and A3, to completely define the unit cell. So let me summarize. Lattice points have identical environments. Uh, a unit cell has to be space filling, and it can be defined by a set of basis vectors, A1, A2, and A3, and the magnitudes of those vectors are known as the lattice parameters, and the angles between those vectors are conventionally called alpha, beta, and gamma. <coughs> now, in three dimensions, there are 14 different ways in which you can arrange a regular set of points. Just like in two dimensions, we had just five different ways. In three dimensions, there are only 14 different ways 
of arranging a periodic set of points. So I will come back to the discussion of the Brave lattices a little bit later on in the lecture. First, I want to explain to you how to, um, how to refer to directions in a unit cell. Well, you know, the unit cell is defined by a set of basis vectors, A1, A2, and A3. So any direction U within that cell can be defined simply in terms of its components u1, u2, and u3 relative to your reference frame. And we conventionally write the indices of that direction, that means the components of that vector along the basis vectors, in square brackets when we are referring to a particular direction. So this is how in crystallography we refer using square brackets to a specific direction. So here, for example, this vector u in this two-dimensional lattice has a component along a1, which is just one a1, and a component along a2, which is just one a2, and therefore its indices in square brackets are one, one. Now, in this case, the component along a1 is one, and let's assume that the component along a2 is a half. So it would be a bit clumsy to write this in square brackets as one and a half. So what we do is we simply convert things into integers and write this as a vector two, one. Okay. So it has a component of two A1 along here and one along here, which is the same as this direction u. Now, just to practice, this particular vector u has a component along a1, which is minus one, and along a2, which is one. So we write its indices as bar one, that means minus one along a1, and one along a2, again in square brackets. This vector u has components 2a1 and 1a2, so it becomes 2, 1. So specifying the indices of a direction is very easy. We simply refer to the basis vectors and find the components of that vector along that direction. Similarly, uh, in three dimensions, uh, there's no real difference. The red vector there has components one along each of the basis vectors, so we write it as one, one, one. And this particular vector has no component along A1, but a component one along A2 and one along A3, so we write it as zero, one, one. So specifying the indices of a direction is very easy. Now, when we have symmetry in crystals, then certain directions are exactly equivalent to other directions. So for example, uh, in this case, the 1, 0, 0 direction is along here, and the atomic arrangement along A1 is exactly, atomic arrangement or the arrangement of lattice points along A1 is exactly the same as along A2 and A3. So these are called crystallographically equivalent directions, and whether you call them 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, or 0, 0, 1, simply depends on how you start off by defining your reference frame. So 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and the opposites, bar 1, 0, 0, 0, bar 1, 0, and 0, 0, bar 1, all belong to the form 1, 0, 0. And to identify crystallographically equivalent directions, that means if I want to refer to, for example, deformation along that direction, then I would use these brackets here because the deformation along 100 zero zero will be exactly identical to that along 010 zero zero if I stress them in the same way. So 
These are specific directions. One zero zero definitely lies along here relative to the reference frame and zero one zero definitely lies along here. But when I use these brackets, I mean deformation along, I mean that these are all crystallographically equivalent positions. Uh, now, in terms of uh, defining the orientation of a plane in three dimensions, a plane is defined by its normal. Okay, so there's a vector which is normal to that direction. And we will see later on in the course that this vector is not referred to the real lattice here, A1, A2, A3, but something called the reciprocal lattice. I don't want you to worry about this at this stage. We will do this in a little bit more detail in a later lecture. But the way you would refer to this particular plane is first of all, you'd find its intercepts along A1. So here the intercept is one, here the intercept is one, and here the intercept is half. So the intercepts are one, one and a half. And then to define the indices of this plane, you take the reciprocal of these intercepts. So the indices are one, one, two, and we use round brackets to specify uh, indices of a specific plane. Okay, so you find the intercepts, take the reciprocals and convert them into integers that defines the um, indices of that plane. And I'll tell you a secret which will be explained in a later lecture that these are actually the components of a vector in reciprocal space. Okay. And that is why we are doing this strange thing of finding the intercepts and taking the reciprocals. We'll prove that in a later lecture. So here, for example, this uh, plane has intercepts one, one, and one. So um, the intercepts would be one, one, and one. And if I take the reciprocal of the intercepts, that gives me the indices, which in this case happens to be one and one. And I'm using round brackets because I'm referring to this plane specifically and not, for example, another plane in a similar, um, another equivalent plane. So the indices here, uh, intercepts are one, 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 and the indices, therefore, when I take the reciprocals, are also one and one. Uh, this is a bit more difficult. So this plane has no intercept along A1 or you could argue that it will intercept A1 at infinity. Uh, uh, it has an intercept of one uh, on A2, and it has no intercept on A3. So the intercepts are infinity, one, and infinity. If I take the reciprocal of that, and if you assume that one divided by infinity is zero, then the indices are zero, one, zero. Another example where this red plane has no intercept along A1, in other words, it intercepts it at infinity. Along A2, the intercept is one, and along A3, it's one. So the indices are zero, one, one, the reciprocal of infinity, one, and one. Now, similar to the case where we had crystallographically equivalent directions, uh, because of the symmetry of a crystal, you might have crystallographically equivalent planes. So for example, each of the cubed faces really will have an identical arrangement of lattice points. So in the case of the 1, 1, 1 planes, uh, I have 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, bar 1, 1, bar 1, 1, bar 1, 1, 1, and you know, their opposites. These are all crystallographically equivalent. And whether you label it as one 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 or bar one 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 depends on your definition of the basis vectors when you started your analysis. Now, to express crystallographically equivalent planes, we use brackets which are braces instead of round because the round brackets refer to a specific plane. Okay, now let's uh, consider the different kinds of unit cells that we get in three dimensions. So here is a body-centered cubic unit cell. Uh, 
So we have um, lattice points at each corner and a lattice point right in the middle. And all of these lattice points are crystallographically equivalent. So there are two lattice points per unit cell. So this is not a primitive cell. Now, it's easy to visualize this in three dimensions. But later on in the course, when we start dealing with uh, more complex crystal structures containing large numbers of let, uh, atoms, uh, it would be much easier if we draw projections. So here, for example, is a projection of this unit cell onto its basal plane here. So these are the atoms at height zero and one, zero and one, which we don't label. So you assume that they are at height zero and one. And this is the body centering lattice point, which is at a height half. So we label that as a height half. And you'll see later on that this becomes an extremely useful way of representing complicated crystal structures and to identify uh, symmetry elements much more easily than looking at a clutter of three dimensional uh, arrangements. So this is the body-centered cubic cell because all its edges are equal and all the angles are 90 degrees. Uh, this is the face-centered cubic cell where you have lattice points at the corners and at the center of each of the faces. And in our projection, these are the lattice points located at heights zero and one, uh, including the, this one in the middle here. And these are the lattice points at the vertical face centers, uh, points uh, the, for this, 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 and this, located at a height half above the basal plane. So much easier to see the structure in a projection than in this three-dimensional diagram. So this is uh, uh, called cubic F, F meaning face-centered. And if I go back one slide, uh, this is cubic I. I stands for body-centered in German. Okay. So these are the three kinds of cubic unit cells. Uh, we, we've already talked about the face-centered cell, cubic F, body-centered cell, cubic I, and the primitive cubic cell, uh, where we just have lattice points at the corners of the cell. And in all these cases, the lattice parameters are all equal and the angles are all 90 degrees. So these are three of the 14 Brave lattices. Now, we've already mentioned symmetry in some respects because we are talking about equivalent directions and equivalent planes, and that can only happen if there is some symmetry in the arrangement. So all the lattice point arrangements on this face are exactly identical to this face, so these two faces are said to be crystallographically equivalent. And we need to identify the symmetry elements in a bit more uh, systematic way. So we've already said that the crystal is defined by long range periodicity. So if I go from one lattice point to another, I reproduce exactly the same structure. Uh, so this is translational symmetry. Uh, we may have rotational symmetry. That means if I have an axis in our cell and I rotate by 90 degrees in this case, then I, re whoops, sorry, then I reproduce the exact structure at that location and similarly. So this is called a fourfold rotation axis. Um, we may have mirror planes inside our cell. Uh, so this is a reflection of this. Um, these, uh, these two are not translational elements of symmetry. Uh, they involve a rotation or a reflection. A screw axis is where you rotate and you translate parallel to the screw. So it's exactly like a mechanical screw that you are rotating and translating at the same time to reproduce the structure that's present in the original location. So in this case, this is a screw dyad, which involves a rotation of 180 degrees, and then a translation, which is half of the repeat distance here. So this is called a screw dyad. A dyad is simply uh, 
a two-fold rotation axis. In a glide plane, uh, we do the mirror operation, that means we reflect this way, and then we do a translation parallel to that plane to reproduce the feature. So this not only involves reflection, but also a translation parallel to that plane. Okay? So th these are the basic symmetry elements uh, that we'll be talking about in, in the lectures as they happen. So we have talked about rotation axes. Uh, this is a fourfold rotation axis where the rotation is by 90 degrees. Um, we can have a twofold rotation axis where the rotation is 180 degrees. And this is a twofold rotation combined with a translation of a half of the repeat distance, which is a screw diet. I now want to illustrate to you uh, a hexad, which also involves a translation, so is a screw hexad. This is uh, uh, the structure of hexagonal closed packed iron. And right in the middle is what we call a screw hexad. That means if I take this atom, which is located at half height, and I rotate about this axis, which is normal to the diagram, by 60 degrees, I don't recover another atom at zero height. But if I include the translation of half along the hexad, then I go from there to this blue position, which is at height half. So it involves a rotation as well as a translation parallel to the hexad. And in this case, the translation is by half the repeat distance, three divided by six. Okay. That gives me the fraction of translation along the repeat distance. So this is a screw hexad. There is a, another element of symmetry, a, a center of symmetry. So imagine that we have this triangle here. And if I invert each of the vertices through the center, then I generate another triangle along there. And therefore, this is a center of symmetry. And here is a molecule which also illustrates the center of symmetry. Uh, here, if I take this hydrogen and I invert it through the middle, I recover a hydrogen over there. And the same applies to these other uh, other groups, chlorine inverted through the center, I get to this point here. So that's called the center of symmetry. Now, in terms of rotation axes, you cannot just have any old rotation because the periodicity of the lattice limits which rotations you can have. And that's, uh, that can be illustrated with this very simple calculation. So here we have a regular arrangement of points uh, spaced uh, a distance A apart. And if I implement a rotation of theta degrees with an axis pointing out of the plane of the board at this point, then I recover this position here. So that's a rotation of theta, which leads me to this point. And similarly, a rotation of theta about this leads me to this point. And this distance x must be an integral number of the repeat distances a, if we are going to reproduce the lattice by doing this rotation, okay? So n is an integer. And uh, using simple maths, you know, this distance here is a cos 30. Therefore, this distance is a minus 2 cos 30. So we see that n a is equal to a minus 2 a cos theta. And therefore, cos theta is 1 minus n over 2. Uh, and since cos uh, must lie between minus 1 and 1, the only solutions are minus one, minus half, zero, and a half. And these are the possible angles of rotation. There is no five-fold rotation, for example, or seven-fold rotation. It's either two-fold, three-fold, four-fold, or six-fold. Okay. So because of the periodicity of lattice, we cannot have a five-fold rotation axis in this periodic array of, of um, points. In this course, we are going to deal completely generally with crystals, and therefore we need to learn about all the possible crystal classes. Now, a crystal class means that that particular class has a set of symmetry elements which completely define its character. 
In other words, if they don't have the basic defining symmetry elements, they cannot belong to that class. So this uh, is a table of the different systems like cubic, hexagonal, trigonal, tetragonal, orthorhombic, monoclinic, and triclinic. These are the lattice parameters, and these are the angles between the axes. And the defining symmetry of a cube is that you must be able to find four threefold rotation axes, triads. Uh, obviously, for a hexagonal cell, you must be able to find a hexad, a six-fold rotation axis. In the case of a trigonal cell, uh, I'll show you later, uh, there is only one threefold axis, not four. Okay? So if, if you only find one threefold axis, then it belongs to the trigonal class. This is a, a tetrad, a fourfold axis. An orthorhombic cell has four dyads, four two-fold axes of rotation passing through the centers of each of the rectangular faces. A monoclinic, a single dyad, and a triclinic does not have any rotation axis except going through 360 degrees, so we call that a, a monad. So these are the defining symmetries. So if you see a shape, okay, in which you can see four triads, then that must be cubic, and so on. So it's a very useful system of uh, classifying the crystals. So cubic F, cubic I, and cubic P will all have four triads associated with them. And along with the seven crystal classes and the different lattices we can have within each class, uh, we generate the Bravais lattices. So here's our old familiar cubic class with the primitive, face-centered, and body-centered. And then we have the various other cells with different kinds of uh, lattice point arrangements. And there's only 14 different ways of doing this. Okay. So of course, you can have a random arrangement of points, but you would not have long-range periodicity. So if you were trying to print a wallpaper, which is different, you could actually print it with a random set of points. And then when you're aligning the bits of wallpaper, there's no difficulty because you don't have to match at the edges. Whereas those patterns which are produced using a repeat pattern uh, on a wallpaper, you have to actually align so that you don't get a sudden jump in the pattern at the edges of the wallpaper. So similarly, in three dimensions, we can have a random set of points. Uh, and we've already said how, you know, if your material is amorphous, if it's a glass, or whether the glass is silica glass or metallic glass or solidified magma. A glass means that, you know, you have a random set of arrangements, which is configurationally frozen. Just as uh, we, drew projections of the cubic unit cells. It's much easier to visualize the different Bravais lattices as projections. And where the lattice points are not labeled, they are at height zero and one. So these are all projections on the, on the basal plane. And those lattice points which are not uh, at zero and one are labeled as half. Okay, So that's basically uh, an introduction to elementary crystallography. I'm going to show you a really nice example. So here we have a, a phase diagram of pure iron. Okay, we're plotting temperature versus pressure. And this is pure iron. And under ambient conditions, pure iron is body-centered cubic arrangement of iron atoms uh, on each of the lattice points of the BCC lattice. And we call that ferrite, okay? If I increase the pressure, that will tend to transform into this hexagonal closed packed lattice, which has a greater density than the ferrite. Okay? So um, generally speaking, when you apply pressure, the material wants to become more compact, and therefore you get a transition from alpha to epsilon, the body-centered cubic to the hexagonal closed packed lattice. If I raise the temperature, I get a face-centered cubic arrangement, which is known as austenite. 
And with austenite, if I increase the pressure, I also get a transition to epsilon. So yeah, you can guess which is the most dense allotropic form of iron. It's, uh, it's, it's epsilon, okay? Because pressure favors the transition from the body-centered cubic to the hexagonal flow spec, and also from the face-centered cubic to the um, hexagonal flow spec. Um, there is a peculiarity here. Uh, you know, as I raise the temperature, I get a transformation from body-centered cubic to face-centered cubic, and then back into body-centered cubic. And this is really strange, uh, because you would expect uh, this kind of behavior if there's some other feature playing a role, right? There's no other element which, has, which behaves in this way, where we start off at low temperatures with a body-centered cubic structure, transform into face-centered cubic, and then transform back into body-centered cubic. Now, before I explain this to you, um, well, I can give you a clue. So what happens is that this structure here, under ambient conditions, is stabilized by the fact that it's ferromagnetic. So the magnetic component of free energy is so large that it overcomes, uh, it, it has a lower free energy than that of austenite. Uh, and the austenite itself has certain magnetic properties which make it favorable for the material to transform back into a body-centered cubic state at a higher temperature. Now, given that this is the most stable phase at high pressures and you know if i extend this diagram you'll find it's also stable at fairly high temperatures the structure in the center of the earth the core inner core of the earth where the conditions are extremely high pressure and high temperatures is believed to be hexagonal closed packed iron solid hexagonal closed packed iron it would be wonderful to know whether that is essentially a very large single crystal because it's existed there for such a long time and such a high temperature. Now, the way that uh, you explore the state of the iron in the middle of the earth is you send shock waves, longitudinal and transverse shock waves, and then you interpret them when you receive the reflections on uh, at other locations. Alternatively, you can do first principles calculations uh, using electron theory uh, and using these known parameters of pressure and temperature to see which allotropic form of iron is most stable. And this, this inner core is followed by liquid iron. And of course, it's not pure iron. It is an alloy of, of iron, nickel, and a few other things. This region here is all kinds of... Uh, oxides of silica, uh, silicon and so forth. And we live on a tiny bit at the very top. Now, if you do first principles calculations, then you actually predict that the hexagonal form of iron is the ground state. Right? And the reason for this is that these calculations, uh, which were done in 1990, don't take account of magnetism, okay? If you allow magnetism in your calculations, then the body-centered cubic structure becomes the most stable. Uh, here we are plotting effectively the density, and this is the cohesive energy. So the structures with lower cohesive energies are the ones that would tend to be more stable. Of course, with first principles calculation, you can let your imagination run wild, and think about what would happen if iron was in its diamond crystal structure <coughs> or a primitive hexagonal and so forth. But the energy gaps here are really quite large, okay? So that's not going to happen. Uh, I never say never, you know, you never know what sort of conditions you're going to reach in some weird planet out there. Now, there is a consequence. Uh, of this. Um, so these elements, iron, ruthenium, and osmium, 
are all ion analogs in the sense that their outer electron shells have similar uh, electronic arrangements. Therefore, chemically, they behave similarly. Okay? But ruthenium and osmium do not have ferromagnetism. So whereas iron is polycentered cubic, ruthenium, osmium are hexagonal. Now, just imagine, you know, the problems we have with the hexagonal cubic, hexagonal closed back structure, you know, limited slip system, brittleness, and so forth. So if we did not have ferromagnetism in iron, we would not have civilization as we know it, because everything that you see around you in modern life either uses steel or you need steel to manufacture it, including your computer. Uh, so you have to thank ferromagnetism for civilization as it stands. Okay, so that's the end of today's lecture. And I will begin in the next lecture with more on symmetries when we start putting atoms or groups of atoms on each of the lattice points and look at point group symmetries.